Right, this is um, part two of the tutorial on uniform continuity of the Fourier transform and it's about bad behaviour of the uh, <clears throat> uh, of functions and there is a detailed paper on the website which uh, covers this um, and which you can uh, look at at your leisure. So in part one we showed that the um, Fourier transform is well behaved in terms of uniform continuity but is it well behaved generally? We know that when we started with the simple <coughs> box function that that gave us a Fourier transform which is uniformly continuous but we didn't explicitly calculate it. I just told you that it was the sinc function. So let's just do the integration. This is the um, the uh, box function there and here's the Fourier transform so it's just the simple integral uh, of this thing here over from minus a half to one when we do that integration we get sine pi xi over pi xi which is the sinc function so that's where it comes from it looks like this uh, as you can see it's bounded by one uh, and tails off now any Fourier theory textbook will tell you that the integral of the sinc function over the real line is 1. Now, <clears throat> in one of my papers, oh, it's called um, Basic Fourier Integrals, I proved this laboriously. And if you understand that proof, you may guess that this thing here, when you take the absolute value of it, might not converge because you've got these alternating areas here of positive and negative and ultimately because of these alternating areas this is why you get the convergence to one here but when you take the absolute value um, you uh, there's at least a doubt a reasonable doubt as to the convergence of this and it's more than reasonable, it doesn't converge. So what we have to show is that this thing here just simply diverges as m uh, gets larger. And what we do is we, we take m to be equal to n plus 1, you'll see y in a second, and we look at this interval here from minus n plus 1 to n plus 1. Now certainly we can assert the following here. Just look at what we're doing. We're splitting this integral here up into its just its positive part. So we're, we're, we're forgetting about the negative or the contributions from the negative part of the axis. So this part of the uh, this inequality must be true because we're dropping off um, uh, non-negative values um, from this integral. And what we're doing here is we're just simply um, taking bits of the domain of integration with gaps. So we go from um, pi on 4 there, 3 pi on 4, and then there's a gap, and then we start at, um, um, sorry, we start at a quarter, and it goes to 3 quarters, and then we start at 5 on 4, and then we go to um, uh, 7 on 4, etc. So clearly this line here holds. Um, all I've done here in this line here, the pi goes out of here because I've made the transformation of xi, you could put an xi dash has gone to, to this. So the... Um, um, So you'd actually have something like if you if you'd have sine xi dash, and then you'd have xi dash there, and you'd have dxi dash over pi, and you can because this is just another variable, you can leave it the same. It's a standard standard thing. There's nothing uh, uh, deep about that. And of course, our 
because XI dash has gone to, to that, these limits change. So that's where that comes from. Now, in, the, in this uh, domain of integration, sine, the absolute value of sine xi is definitely um, uh, greater than 1 over root 2. So that's, that's the top there. And the reason for that is this diagram here. If you just look at pi on 4 to 3 pi on 4, that's where the 1 on root 2 comes for. And you can see that sine xi is above that line there. The next step is we've got to look at the uh, how we can dominate this, this quantity here. And we see that because that's um, declining, we pick the right hand endpoint of the interval and so 1 on xi is going to be greater than this quantity here because everything to the left is higher. And we've got a common factor of pi there, we take that out, we get pi squared. Um, and certainly uh, 1 over k plus 3 quarters is greater than 1 over k plus 1. So that much is true there. And all we've got then is just, uh, these are just constant numbers. These are just constant numbers here. Over an integral over this uh, interval here, which has a width of pi on 2. That's where that comes from. And so we get, in the final analysis, we get this, which is the harmonic series, and that diverges. So you certainly can't use the theorem of part 1 to say that the Fourier transform of this thing here is uniformly continuous. So we started out with the box function, and that satisfied the conditions of the theorem, and you got a uniformly continuous Fourier transform. But when you try to do it again to this thing here, whether you put a you know you have a different variable in there, xi makes no difference. When you try to do it again, because this thing, uh, the integral of this thing diverges, you don't satisfy the hypotheses of that theorem, and hence you can't use it. Now. Now, there is this thing called Schwartz space, which is more forgiving since its inhabitants obey a very strong rule, which I've set out here, and which is that the, the limit as the variable x goes to infinity of this thing here goes to zero. And this is for every k and l greater than or equal to naught. So this is incredibly strong. You're looking at all powers of x, mod x, and you're looking at all the derivatives. The, the zeroth derivative is, is, of course, just the function. And these, these things operate independently. So you can get away with murder in short space, and a lot of the, the proofs of things that... Um, uh, of, of, Fourier, of Fourier theory become so much simpler in, in short space and can be stated... Uh, very, very uh, easily once you've done the, the basic uh, theorems and they're set out in the, the paper on basic Fourier integrals. But that's another story and it gets into the, um, the deeper area of distribution theory, of temperate distributions, and that's uh, well and truly another story. Uh, thanks very much for listening.